Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. To my way of thinking, spirituality and religion originate in a particular kind of felt experience. These experiences are typically short-lived, surprising, and uncontrollable, but they seem to the person having them to be highly significant and highly attractive. They go by a variety of names in different cultures, Kensho, Sartori, the grace of God, sometimes mystical experience, although that gets muddled up with visions and, and special powers, of which we'll say a little bit more as we go along, peak experiences. To try and be reasonably neutral, I'm going to call them simply glimpses, with a capital G. Religions are originally codified and organized sets of such practices. They often develop around an individual who seems to have cracked this quest for stabilization. A Jesus, a Mohammed, a Siddhartha Gautama. Their fleeting glimpse seems to have been held steady. Such people offer promise. If I did it, so can you. And a path follow in my footsteps. One of the apparent consolations of religion is an escape from death. People's anxieties about death are attributed to a physical body that will inevitably let them down, and they're encouraged to find solace in a world of abstract but indestructible forces and entities, such as the immortal soul, almighty God, reincarnation. Mind and pure thought are good and higher, body and emotion are traitorous and lower. So mind and body are split and set at odds with each other. And it's that split that I want to try and offer some thoughts about healing tonight. Glimpses involve an apparently miraculous or gratuitous healing of that split. But I think that miracle can begin to be explained by biology. First, I want to concentrate on what those glimpses are. The first and the one that I want to highlight in this talk this evening is the physicality of that experience. This slide shows some other glimpses taken from a database of thousands gathered over the years by the Alistair Hardy Religious Experiences Research Center, originally at Oxford, now based at the University of Wales in Lampeter. I've highlighted some of the commonly occurring elements, again, particularly the very physical ones. As you'll see, people reach for a variety of metaphors and images as they attempt to describe their glimpses. But it is possible to discern a common core of qualities that many of these experiences share. The left-hand side of this slide summarizes some of what we might call the structural features of the glimpses. They're surprisingly common, in surveys, up to 50 or 60% of people admit to some such experience, and they are very frequent in teenagers too. Such experiences tend to be underreported, however, partly because they're seen as highly personal and private, partly because they're hard to talk about, and partly for fear of being thought odd. They're usually fleeting. Yeats's 20 minutes, more or less, is common, though some come and go in a few seconds, and a few are more lasting. And these experiences vary in their intensity, some being pleasant but not momentous, while others seem to strike at the very foundations of our normal ways of perceiving and feeling. Glimpses seem infuriatingly elusive. They appear out of the blue and disappear again of their own accord and cannot be held on to deliberately. Indeed, the deliberate attempt to control them seems to make them slip away all the more. Nevertheless, despite their evanescence, they're regularly felt not to be illusions, but concrete reality in some sense unmasked, things unusually accurately and intensely perceived. As the English philosopher Alan Watts once put it, the aftermath of a glimpse may require an effort to try to speak the unspeakable, scrut the inscrutable, and F the ineffable. 
Despite this difficulty, there do seem to be a number of common characteristics of a glimpse that can be described relatively easily, and they're listed on the right-hand side of the slide. First, there's the physical burst of vitality and aliveness, often described, as in the extract on the previous slide, as brightness, energy, warmth. Secondly, there's a felt shift from separation to connectedness from being an individual, somewhat isolated observer looking for connectedness to being essentially and intimately connected. One of the most compelling facets of a glimpse seems to be the liberation of affection. Instead of being too busy to care, you notice what needs doing to look after the people and the environment around us, and we naturally do it. Then there's a feeling of ease as a complex weight of considerations and concerns seems to drop away, and life appears radically simplified, though not at all simplistic. Rabindranath Tagore once said, it's very simple to be happy, it's just very difficult to be simple. <laughs> a glimpse seems to reveal the truth of that in direct experience. What is glimpsed is a world in which there is greater trust and less worry, in which mystery or uncertainty do not seem to constantly need explaining and understanding, but simply can be met as they appear. Normal life seems stymied by second thoughts and conflicts of interest by comparison. So I'm suggesting that spirituality and religion start not from a system of belief or observance that offers comfort and meaning, but generically from a first-hand glimpse of a different way of relating to the vicissitudes of life. And this shows up not as a thought, a wish, or an interpretation, but as a direct experience. It is seen and felt, not construed or imagined. It is embodied. Well, can science add anything to our understanding of what these glimpses are, where they come from, what their validity might be, and how they could be earned or at least encouraged? Here are a few of the pioneers. Andy Clark, Professor of Logic and Metaphysics at the University of Edinburgh. Francisco Varela, sadly deceased. Susan Hurley, sadly deceased, Jeffrey Gray, sadly deceased, Mark Johnson and George Lakoff. Actually, at the last minute, I did add one physicist, and some of you will have spotted him, David Bohm, because latterly he was really more of a spiritual inquirer and a psychologist than a physicist. Let's start with systems theory. At the most general level, there's a deepening understanding of human beings as biological systems, technically complex, adaptive, dynamic systems. Biologically, what that means is that we are, in essence, much more like clouds or whirlpools or waves than we are like, for example, snooker balls. We see ourselves as mid-level entities, operating in time scales from seconds to years and sizes from millimeters to kilometers. Like the cloud or the whirlpool, we have the appearance of semi-stability only because we're in constant interaction with wider systems that keep quite literally whipping us into shape. Bodies and minds are semi-stable forms that are composed of constantly changing and constantly interacting stuff. Try to take the whirlpool home in a bucket and you will be disappointed. Waves don't carry the same water forward. They're born, so to speak, have a life, travel, interact and die because they're constantly being whipped into shape by a complicated dynamic interaction between deeper ground swells, currents, wind forces, the phase of the moon, the rotation of the earth, and the wake of a tanker that passed half an hour ago. Conscious mind, we might say, is a kind of phosphorescence that can appear to crest each wave. Astonishingly, right here and now, the world is Guy Claxtoning. 
in a particular, and it has to be said, rather peculiar way. <laughs> the body is what connects us to these wider forces, a dynamic pattern of sensibilities and concerns that are in constant resonance with the larger systems within which it is implicated. David Bohm referred to this wider swirl of energy and information as the implicate order, which explicates itself from time to time as a Guy or a Jonathan. Disconnect me from this incessant flow of perturbations and resources, and like the whirlpool in the bucket, both body and mind immediately begin to disintegrate. The body is much more sensitive to this myriad of shifting influences than the conscious mind. Under controlled conditions, which these aren't, I could have flashed you those eyes that came between the two Jackson Pollock pictures so quickly that you would not have been aware of seeing anything at all. But within 50 milliseconds, your amygdala would have fired up and your body already sending bursts of adrenaline to muscles and heart, and parasympathetic impulses to your gut to dampen the ongoing process of digestion. We're specially built to reverberate to the social world. Digitally enlarge the size of the pupils slightly in a photograph, and I will describe the person as warmer and more attractive than with the smaller pupils, and I won't know why. I won't have spotted consciously the difference, but I will have been changed by them. Mirror my body language in a subtle way, and again, without knowing why, I will trust you more. Through the body, I am deeply ecological, profoundly and ceaselessly in conversation with the physical and social milieu in which I am embedded and from which I am continually emerging. Like the wave, I am made up, concocted by the world around me. Like a mobile phone, I may look like a lump of stuff, but I am actually a quiver with information, whether I'm currently checking myself for messages or not. So says the science of embodiment. The view that consciousness gets is a very partial and in some ways inaccurate reflection of all that activity that is going on below stairs. In this familiar figure, the Canitza Triangle, there is no white triangle lying on top of the black figures, slightly brighter and slightly in front. What consciousness sees is not what's there, but a useful, plausible guess about what's probably there, which in this case is wrong. We actually see the world in terms not of what is so much as what I expect to be able to do about it. If my concerns or priorities change, so does the world. Hills look steeper to tired people. Coins look bigger to hungry children. My current state of bodily needs, resources, and capabilities is constantly being relayed to the brain where it infuses all of the central or higher level processing of which I'm so proud. As the work of Antonio Damasio shows, we know our values first by getting a visceral sense of right and wrong. People's sensitivity to these bodily promptings their ability, our ability to hear and to heed these intuitions, predict how well we make these value-laden decisions. By the pricking of my thumbs, something this way comes, turns out, sometimes at least, to be the most valid form of cognition. Even the understanding of abstract language is underpinned by the body and its capabilities. When I read a sentence like, Guy gave a lecture, my brain's motor system is instantly and irresistibly primed to move my hands outward from my body, so fMRI studies show. If I have to respond to this sentence by moving my hands inward to press the appropriate response button, the motor system gets conflicting messages and the response is slowed down. 
Abstract thinking never loses its roots in the bodily bedrock of sensing, acting, and feeling. The idea that cognition and emotion, mind and body, come from different realms and are constantly at odds with each other just doesn't hold. When I get a joke, comprehension and feeling are locked together. Merely understanding it is quite a different thing. When I gaze at a picture in an art gallery, I'm not thinking much, but my whole being is reverberating with a deep kind of knowing. As Suzuki says, the experience is aesthetic precisely because it is not clearly explicated. In these kinds of experience, our reactions are not considered. They well up from deep inside us. Sometimes they catch us by surprise and often remain unexplicated. But are these moments of being touched or moved or of getting a joke, are they rare moments of embodiment or are they glimpses of a constant state of embodiment? Are we always like that but just not noticing it? Our default way of knowing is simultaneously linguistic, affective and inactive. In fact, it takes effort and sophistication to decouple these systems and to imagine ourselves to be, whether ideally or in fact, calm, rational beings. Perhaps that is what people see and feel in a glimpse. They feel that reintegration and unpent upness. They feel the fertilized egg of thought embedded in the immune system and the digestive system and in smooth and striate muscle. Maybe what Julian of Norwich really said was, all shall well, and all shall well, and all manner of things just well up. Perhaps the very idea of well-being is inherent in those glimpses. If embodied cognition is right, we are capable of badly misconstruing ourselves. We commonly see ourselves in a distorting mirror that minimizes the importance of our bodies and the ecological connections that extend therefrom and exaggerates the importance of the bubbles of conscious thought. A lot of trouble and anxiety is created by that distorted image. But that false reflection does not affect the actual workings of the body, brain, world, system that I actually am. I always carry on, always have carried on, being an ecologically connected and as unconsciously influenced as I always was. And occasionally, if I'm lucky, I get a glimpse of my biological Buddha nature or the Godhead. I see behind the mirror and for a few minutes, all the habitual weightings in my neural networks get reset. In this new light, I find that much of what I had been treating as disastrous turns out to be humorous. The lonely bubble is instantly transmuted into a reverberating network of connections. And a vast conscripted army of neural sensors and sentries, the massive continual deployment of frontal lobe inhibition that I had thought necessary to keep me out of trouble is suddenly redundant. Those neural sentries strip off their uniforms and start to party. How much do we know uh, about getting back in touch with that visceral reality that you painted? Um, and what stops us? I suppose, I mean, the only, the only sort of inadequate answer I would give would be to draw on the fact that there are different, uh, in the yogic traditions, there are different kinds of yoga, aren't there? There is the Hatha yoga. They could, you could pursue, you know, if you buy the story, you could go in a number of different ways. If you're an intellectual like me, you might find intrigue and comfort and even an inspiration through the explicit story, through the understanding itself, the Raja Yoga route. You might want to hang out with people who seem to you, rightly or wrongly, to somehow or other be glimpsters in their own right. 
or you know there are so there are a range of different paths that you might take and you know some of them might be more potent and some of them might just be a matter of kind of individual sure. being the right kind of track to follow for a particular kind of personality at a particular point in its development sure. so i find i mean people like me and sue blackmore would find that this that the, the, the scientific understandings are not just intellectual they are you know, I, I, I feel it, I feel inspired. The, the metaphor of myself as a wave is kind of, I, I feel it, you know? I feel that it has transformative potential. You've come to a view of cognition um, where, uh, you know, it's quite, I don't know if you call it materialist, that might be too strong, but there's certainly a view that, um, you know, you mentioned that quantum mechanics is not the way to go, um, and, and really it's a deeper understanding of the body um, which many, I think, will find intriguing, but others might find somewhat troubling, as if it's sort of deeply rooted in this mm -hmm. world and not in any other kind of world. Yep. Um, and that might also be in contradiction, or at least in tension, with some of these sort of past experiences and people you've admired. Mm -hmm. So how do you reconcile those kind of different things? Ultimately, it doesn't really matter, I don't think, what your metaphysics or what your belief, whether you entertain the, the, in some sense the reality of things that science finds hard to explain, that kind of thing. Wearing my scientist hat, I find it much more interesting and challenging and thought-provoking and productive to try and see how far I can push a material basis for some of the more profound forms of human experience. And I find myself wanting to resist, not necessarily forever, but for the time being, a leap into the assumption that we have to move into the world of the supernatural in order to explain some of these phenomena. So I'm a pragmatist in this respect.